All right. Welcome to week three, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we're on the wrong screen. Dan's on the ball today. Oh, is it coming? Is it? Hello? There we go. Uh, the classroom I just left I had to reboot my laptop four times before the screen came on. So, you know, it's been a little fun today. All right, so week three, we're talking about normalization. Uh, every database person's favorite topic. Um, if you haven't noticed, that was probably sarcastic. So normalization, it's a tool. So it's a process that you use to satisfy specific constraints, and we're going to be going through what the constraints are, to avoid unnecessary duplication of data. And the whole process decomposes relations, which, you know, we talked about those last week, you know, relations, those are uh, their entities and attributes and all that kind of stuff, that have anomalies to produce smaller, well-structured relations. So a well-structured relation, also known as a well-structured table, contains minimal data redundancy. So in other words, you don't want to put more into a table than you have to. So the, the minimal redundancy allows you to insert, update, and delete without causing any kinds of inconsistencies. And there are three kinds of anomalies. There's insertion anomaly. An insertion anomaly means when you're adding a new row, it forces the creation of duplicate data. And I'm pretty sure I've got examples in the slides. A deletion anomaly means you delete a row and when you delete that row, you're also deleting something else that's nowhere, that's not anywhere else. So you're just losing data when you shouldn't. And a modification anomaly means you're changing data in one place. And by changing it there, you have to change it in more than one place. So the goal of normalization is when you insert something, you only insert what's pertinent to what you're putting in. When you delete something, you only delete what you're supposed to be deleting. And when you update, you only ever update if you're updating, a, for example, you're going to update a person's salary, you only ever update the salary in one place. You don't update the salary in three or four places. And here's our perfect example. I knew I had an example in this. So we got a table here. And it, by the way, it's a really shitty table. But it's a table. It's a relation. It's not normalized. And in here we have a few issues. We, if we try to add an employee, we can't hire a new employee without them taking a class. So, for example, if we are in primary key was employee and course title. So when we look at this, the only way we can identify any given row is a combination of the employee ID and the course title. So we can find Margaret Simpson twice by employee ID 100. And she took SPSS and surveys. I guess that's what it is. If I want to add a new employee, we can't add an employee unless he took a course because there's already one person with no course. So therefore, an insertion anomaly means I cannot add one information without adding extra stuff that really you shouldn't have to add. Deletion. If we go and get rid of Alan Beaton here, so employee 140, Alan Beaton was found cooking the books. They decide, you know, we shouldn't have accountants that fabricate numbers. So we're going to let Alan Beaton go. So we delete Alan Beaton out of this table. What happens if we delete that is that uh, we're going to lose the fact that tax accounting was ever a course. Because you'll notice that tax accounting is nowhere else in here. So if we delete Alan Beaton, we're going to lose the course called tax accounting also. Because it's going to get deleted as part of the delete. That's a deletion anomaly. It means we're deleting something. That doesn't, that has nothing to do with what we're actually deleting. It's just, it's going away with it. A modification. So again, uh, Margaret Simpson did a really good job. So we decided to give her a raise. And the problem is that we'd have to update two records to give her a raise. Now with today's computers, they're pretty fast. So some of these kinds of anomalies aren't necessarily as bad as they used to be. They're still bad. Just, you know. It's a different kind of bad. But back in the day when computers were really, really slow, imagine it updates the first row and then the computer crashes, the database server crashes, there's a power outage. Or if we're going back a long way, the old tape to tape 
the tape breaks. That used to happen. It's old, but, you know, it happened. Well, it's in the update. So suddenly, we have two versions of Margaret Simpson with two different salaries. Which one's the correct salary? That's a modification anomaly. If we have to modify something that should only be done once, but we have to do it in multiple places, that's a modification anomaly. Um, so the goal of normalization is to avoid all three of those situations. Because all three of those are bad things. So these are the steps to normalization. And we are actually only going to really worry about the stuff on the left side of the screen. So we start with a table with multi-valued attributes. The first thing we're going to do is remove multi-valued attributes. And there's a bit of a, there's been a bit of a, hmm, looking for confusion what multi-valued attribute means. Um, multi-valued attributes in this case means two different things. It means uh, attributes that have multiple values in them. It also means groups of rows. Uh, there'll be examples later with that. Uh, that means that once we do that, we're in the first normal form. We remove something called partial dependencies. We'll be in second normal form. We remove the transitive dependencies. We'll be in third normal form. And then 90% of the time, you'll already be in Boyce COD fourth and fifth normal form. Fourth and fifth are for what they call an edge case. It rarely happens, but you know, every once in a while it'll happen. So fourth and fifth is for that. But in most businesses and in enterprise, third normal form is considered good enough. Third normal form covers 98% of database design needs. Uh, Boys COD covers edge cases. Uh, and fourth and fifth, there's other things. All right, so a bit of terminology. A functional dependency. The value of one attribute determines the value of another attribute. So that's what's a functional dependency. So when you look at a student, for example, so we have a student record. The student um, has a student number, a name, and an address. The functional dependency is the student's name and address depends on the student number. In other words, the student number determines the name and the address of the student. So that every student has a student number, and that number for that student will determine the rest of their attributes. That's a functional dependency. The student's name is fully functionally dependent on the identifier, the determinant. Therefore, that's the functional dependency. A candidate key. A candidate key is a unique identifier. One of the candidate keys will often become the primary key. On here, the slide's a little absolute, um, but it will regularly become the primary key unless you use synthetic keys. So for example, there could be a record with a credit card number and a social security number in a table. In this case, both would be candidate keys. Also, as an aside, they're both terrible ideas to have in your database. If you don't need to store that information, please don't ever store credit card information, social security numbers. Don't ever put that in a database unless you have to. Well, that's just some professional advice from me. Um, so each non-key field is functionally dependent on every candidate key. So essentially, when you're looking at a relation, any field that is not, or any yeah, any field or any attribute has to be functionally dependent on every candidate key. Otherwise, it's going to be something called a partial dependency. All right, so we're going to start with, we're going to be using this example for the rest of the slide deck. So we have an invoice sample. And in here, we have identified the primary key for this table. So it's the order ID plus the product ID. However, this is not a valid relation. Can somebody tell me why it's not a valid relation? Yes, that's it. So this over here, this block right here, is known as a repeating group of rows or multi-valued attributes. So 
this record here for this order, order 1006, this is the record right here, okay? The order record. Each of these columns have multiple values in it for that order. So for order 1006, we have product ID 7, 5, and 4, dining table, writer's desk, entertainment center, et cetera, et cetera, going across. The reason this is not a valid relation is every single row in here isn't a complete row. So we have multi-valued attributes, or in this case, a repeating group of rows. A repeating group of columns, sorry. So some more terminology, because literally normalization is just terminology. Multi-valued attributes are attributes that can have multiple values for a single instance. Yeah, I got a typo in there. Uh, multi-valued attributes are attributes that can have multiple values for a single entity instance. Example, phone numbers. Or in this case, we have multiple blocks of rows of columns for each one of these. A repeating group of row is a set of two or more columns that are related to each other and can contain multiple values for a single entity instance. So essentially, this is a multi-valued attribute. This as a whole is a, a repeating group of rows. So both of those stop you from being in first normal form. So how do you fix it? You just fill in the whole line. Uh, yes, the slide's really small, so you know if you have it up on your screen, you can probably zoom in a little bit more. Um, so to be in first normal form, there's no multi-valued attributes, there's no repeating group of rows. So as you can see right now, we've got complete row for each one of these. Every attribute is atomic. That means that each attribute has one value in it. So that means that the combination of a row plus a column only ever had, the intersection of a row and a column only ever has one value in that spot. Just like in Excel, right? You got a spreadsheet in Excel, for every row and column, you should have only one value in the cell, same idea. Um, and technically the primary key is defined, that goes without saying. So now this is officially in first normal form. It still has all kinds of problems, but at least, Technically, we could probably go and update the data. So there's issue with this example. So if a new product is ordered for order 1007, the customer data must be re-entered. So if we go look at order 107, 1007, down the last two here, we want to add another product to that order. We end up having to duplicate all of the customer information, the order date, and all that for the next row. So we end up having to duplicate this whole block for every time we add a product to an order. So that's an insertion anomaly. We're adding extra stuff that really we should not. A deletion. So if we go back to order 1006 and we go and delete the dining room table, so we get, so suddenly um, Value Furniture decides they don't want to have the dining room table ordered. So we delete that from their order. You will notice that we will also lose the fact that we can even sell a dining room table because it's nowhere else in the system. Yeah, I know there's only five lines, but pretend there's more, but there's only one dining room table entry. That's a deletion anomaly. We're gonna lose the fact that the dining room table ever existed. Update. So if we wanna update product number four, so if we look in here, you see there's product number four here, product number four there. If we wanna change the price of product number four, we have to update in multiple places. That means it's multiple write operations. There's always a risk that something's going to go wrong. Server blue screens. Power outage goes out and the UPS doesn't kick in in time. You know, CPU fries itself because it's running on an Asus motherboard. You know, all kinds of things like that. There's a variety of issues that happen from that. So it's bad having to update the price of a thing in more than one place. So why do these issues exist? It's because there's multiple entity types in the same table. When we look at, when we go back looking at this table, we'll see that there's multiple entity types. We have an order, we have customers, we have products, we have quantities. So we're actually tracking four different things in this one table. This could be good as a report. 
So you print that off. You got a report for the manager to look at, you know, the sales for the day, shipping, that kind of thing. Cool. But that's unusable in a production environment as the data store. So which is going to get us now, we're going to try to get the second normal form. So in second normal form, we have something called partial dependency. This occurs when a non-key attribute depends on only part of the primary key. A full functional dependency means that every non-key attribute in a relation is fully functional and dependent on the primary key. So if we go over here, we can see that, for example, the product description depends on the product ID. The product description has nothing to do with the order ID. Therefore, product description is, only, is a partial dependency. It depends on part of the primary key because our primary key right now is order ID and product ID, but the product description, price and finish only depend on the product ID. Therefore, it's partially dependent. It's a partial dependency. So to be in second normal form, you must first be in first normal form. You can't be a super Saiyan unless you're a Saiyan first. It's the same idea. You cannot be a superior form unless you've already achieved the first form. Every non-key attribute is fully functional dependent on the entire primary key. Every non-key attribute must be defined by the entire key and not part of the key. So there's no functional, functional dependencies. So now we got this diagram here. Man, did I actually hit the record button? I hope so. Yes, second guessing myself that I wasn't recording the lecture <laughs> all of a sudden. All right, so this is, without the data, this is our table structure. We took the data out, no, no data structure. So we have two kinds of dependencies in here. We're only gonna worry about, well, so we got three kinds of dependencies in here, but we're only gonna worry about the first two. So we have a full dependency already. The order quantity is dependent on the, in the entire primary key. So the order ID plus product ID will give us the ordered quantity. So in order 1006, product seven, we ordered three. We can figure out what was ordered on each order for each product. We have partial dependencies. Uh, the product description, finish and price only depends on the product ID. And the order ID currently de determines the order date, the customer ID, name and address. We're not gonna worry about this little thing up here called the transitive dependency. Don't worry about that in third normal form. So the determinants are listed below. The order ID depends, determines all this. The customer ID determines this. The product ID determines these. And in the end, the compound key determines the quantity. So how do we fix this? We take the partial dependencies and break them out to their own entities. So we are going to decompose that big entity into three other entities. So now, we, if we take, since we know literally, like you see these four things right here, we know that the order ID determines this, the product ID determines that, and this determines this. Therefore, that's the three entities. We're gonna break it down that way. So suddenly we have, a thing called an order line. It has an order ID, a product ID on the ordered quantity. So the ordered quantity is fully dependent on the whole key. And it just so happens that there's no transitive dependencies, which I'll be talking about in a minute. So that means it's in third normal form. We're going straight from first to third with it. Same thing with the product. By putting the product by itself, it goes straight to third normal form because there's no other dependencies. Now. On the order table, we have the order ID determines the date and the customer ID. That's a full dependency. And then we have this down here, which is a transitive, which I'm gonna define in a moment. So a transitive dependency occurs when a non-key attribute is, fully, is functionally dependent on another non-key attribute. So it, let's make it a little clearer. It's when one value is determined by another value that is not a primary key. So in this row, we decided that the order ID is the primary key. Great. But the customer ID 
determines the name and the address of the customer. So to get the customer name, I actually have to go from order ID to customer ID to customer. That means the second you go, you, it's called a transitive because you have to transit through one attribute to get to, to the key. So the customer name is determined by the customer ID, which is determined by the order ID. In other words, to get the customer name, you have to transit through the customer ID to get to the order ID. The second you say that this determines this, which in turn determines that, that is a transitive dependency. That's bad because that allows duplication of data. Or if we need to up, let's say, in this case, it's pretty straightforward. We got order ID 1006, then we have order ID 1008, same customer, but we need to change their address. That means we'd have to update their address in two places. It's not part of the primary key, so we're not gonna lose any order information, but we're still duplicating data. So to be in third normal form, you must be first and second normal form. There must be no transitive dependencies, which is what we're talking about right now. So the solution is anything with a non-key determinant that has a transitive dependency gets into a new table. So again, we just take it, break it down into smaller pieces. So we take this up here and we slice it in two. In the order, if we create, instead of customer order, we create two objects called order and customer. In the customer, we'd keep the ID and the name and the address. And we'd have a foreign key in the order pointing to the customer. So that means that we the same customer can order 25 times, but if we need to update their address, we change it in one place because it'll be reflected through the foreign key. And if we were to take that and convert that into a um, complete diagram, that's what it would look like in the end. So there's our um, logical diagram. So the customer has an ID, name and address. The customer places or zero or more orders, and the order has an order date and the customer ID. Uh, the product has an ID and some descriptions, and the combination of the order plus the product will determine the order line, so how much was ordered at a given point in time. So we went from this to this. So that means that we can update the address in one place. We can change the price in one place. We can update. Uh, if we decide that the customer didn't want to order that table, we just delete the order line. We don't lose the fact that the table ever existed. We don't lose the order. We don't lose the customer. We just lose the fact that they ordered that one thing. So it allows us to do atomic updates. We, if we need to change something, we change it once and in only one place. That's the goal of normalization. Which leads us to uh, voice cod. So it's a relation that has more than one candidate key. Um, anomalies sometimes occur when they're in third normal form. Uh, a relation is said to be in voice cod if and only if every determinant relation is a candidate key. Um, and simply put, voice cod again is every attribute or field depends on the key, nothing but the key. Uh, often voice cod is referred to as normal form three and a half because it's really third normal form with an edge case taken out, but it happens before fourth normal form. So you got third normal form, fourth normal form, and they put one in the middle. So they decided to call it, you know, three and a half, also known as voice cod. And um, I'm actually going to do an example on the board because it's way simpler to do it on the board as a whole. I really wish I brought all my colored markers though, but that's okay. Now, I'm just gonna bring this up really quick to make sure I'm catching as much of that board as I can. Oh, it's easy. Okay, that's the door. That's not going to be very good, but we're going to go with it. Okay. I have a bag at home of like 
16 different mark colors, but I forgot it. Because actually last term I used a different set of slides for this and they were a lot, they were a lot less succinct. There's a lot of pointless examples in them and weird glyphs. And, and I decided, you know what, we're gonna go to a basic set of slides without extra noise. Okay. Uh, I really wish I could remember what example I did last term. We go. Actually, I'm going to do something really similar to that. So we're going to go. Uh, Okay, so this is pretty much the same thing as I had going there, but I actually want to go through it on the board. It'll make a bit more sense. Uh, uh, date. So, order one, 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 twenty, customer forty four. Name is Bob. Product uh, A1, it's a ruler for $3.99, bought four. Uh, I may bought product B2, pencil at uh, 99 cents, and he bought 20. We got order I3 on uh, one. 21. That's for number 66. Bill, he bought a one ruler 399. He bought six of those. Okay. So it's the exact same thing we had going earlier. So for starters, we know this isn't in one and F for two reasons. Item number one, reason number one is we have not identified the primary key. So we want to identify the primary key like that. So now we know if we can find each row like that. But the other issue is, as she identified earlier, is that we have um, a repeating group of rows. So we need to fill that in. So now we're technically in first normal form. We have no repeating groups of rows, no multi-valued attributes, and we have a primary key. So it's first normal form. However, we currently have some partial dependencies. The order number determines the date, the customer number, and the name. The product and the description and the price, just like the examples I had on the slides, and then the the order number and the product determines the quantity. So those are partial dependencies. So to fix it, we need to break it down into separate entities. So we're going to create three entities for now. So we're going to go. Uh, Customer order. And we are going to have a product. No, yeah, product. And order line. All right. 
and in customer product, in customer order, we have the order number, the date, customer number, and the customer name, product as the product number, which is called the product in this case, a description and a price. And the order line has the order number, product, and quantity. So now we're in a state where that's fully dependent on the key because we know this is the key. That's the key. And that's the key for that one. So again, these two are fully dependent on this. And currently these are fully dependent on that one. So this one is now in 3NF. This one's in 3NF. That one, on the other hand, has transitives in it because the customer name is determined by the customer number and the customer number is depend, determined by the order number. So we have a transitive, which means that this one currently is only in two NF. How do you fix that? Pretty straightforward. You explode it into smaller pieces. So you'd end up with, actually, you know what, I'll do it below. So maybe my camera will pick that up. So we end up with customer. which has a customer number and a name. We have an order, which has a, I don't know why I was drawing a queue, order, number, customer, number, and a date. We have a product. Has the product in it, the description, and the price, and the order line. Okay, I'm not sure what language I'm writing in right now, but order line, which gives us the order number. and uh, the product and the quantity. And now everything's in third normal form because everything is completely dependent on the primary key. like that. Now in here, when we look at this, we know that there's foreign keys and this is where I wish I had one more color. Do I have a green? Please, let there be one, nope, there's not. Oh well. So we know in here that the customer number is a foreign key. The order number and the product are foreign keys. So this one is in, they're all in third normal form. So these are all three and F. This is a strong entity. The product is a strong entity. The order technically is a weak entity. 
even though the customer number doesn't participate in the primary key, it's still a weak entity because you can't have an order without the customer number. Therefore, it's weak because it cannot exist without that. And the order, then, then the order line is also a weak entity. Now, I'm going to throw in a piece of terminology. It's not going to be on a test, uh, but there is. Um, the wording I'm going to use is not going to be on the test, but it's similar to something I talked about already. So this is a weak entity. This is known as what's called an ID dependent entity. So when things are an ID dependent entity, it means that the foreign keys are also part of the primary key. So this is ID dependent. which is also known as it's an identifying relationship because you need to have the foreign key as part of the primary key. Therefore the foreign key identifies the primary key in this one. It is a non ID dependent weak entity, which is known as a non identifying relationship. So this is all the terminology that you'll ever see for, you know, normalization and that kind of stuff. And yes, I'm going to take pictures of my phone too, so I can upload them. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's go talk about the order right now. First, the order has a primary key, foreign key. The foreign key is not part of the primary key. It is still a weak entity because it needs a customer number to exist, but the customer number does not define the row. Therefore, it's a non-ID dependent. In other words, it's non-identifying. So it's a non-identifying relationship. The last one on the bottom, the foreign keys are part of the primary key. That means they are. it is a weak entity that happens to be ID dependent. In other words, it needs the foreign keys as part of its primary key to exist. Therefore, it's an identifying relationship because the foreign key helps identify a unique row, okay? People's brains melted a bit? Yeah. Okay, so for something to be in third normal form, all the attributes, depend on the primary key and only the primary key. In a second normal form, there are no partial dependencies, right? So for example, price and description depend on products. It only depends on part of the key. So here there are no partial dependencies. So it's definitely in second normal form. It just happens that there's also no transitive. So it's also in third. When a, an attribute depends on an attribute that depends on an attribute. In other words, customer name is defined by the customer number. The customer number is defined by the order number. That is known as a transitive dependency. So if a relation has, is, has no partial dependencies, but has a transitive dependency, it's known to be in second normal form. If there is no partial dependencies and no transitives, then it's in at least third normal form. It just so happens that these two are worth it because they're so simple. These are so simple that they literally blew through and went right to the wind, right to the wind, to the end of the race. Um, so the difference between a second and third normal form is in second normal form has transitive dependencies, third normal form does not. Okay. That's pretty, the, the, the worst part about 
normalization of the terminology. Once you wrap your brain around the terminology of how what the stuff actually means, the the principles of of normalization get simpler. But it's a case of learning what the, these things mean, and uh, which is why the slides are now organized the way they are with very short descriptions of what each of the pieces of terminology with a, a walkthrough. Any other questions? Okay, because in here we were able to identify any given row without the customer number. So the customer number was never part of a primary key. Therefore, it is fully dependent on the order number and only the order number. In the meantime, the description, the price is only determined by the product. That's that's the difference. Because we could find any given, so when you're starting normalization, you need to find your primary keys because you may not always have your primary keys. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go look at the data and try to find the minimum number of attributes or columns that will let you find a row uniquely. That will be your first primary key. After that, all the rules start from there. Once you've made sure that there's no blanks, right? So no repeating groups, no multi-valued attributes. And you now look at across the, all of the data and see which combination of columns allows me to find any given row uniquely. First normal form, that's where we start. And then we figure out our partial dependencies, which customer number is not partly dependent on anything. It's fully dependent on the order number at this date. And the description is only dependent on the product, so we break those out. Then we just have the transitive dealing with the customer. What if we give Bill always a 20% discount? Uh, we would be doing that later. Uh, no, no. Um, that, that would mean that we'd need to have another column in here. For and odds are, the discount will be part of the customer. So we'd be putting in like, let me take a picture of the board at this because it's nice and clean. Yeah, no worries. That's a valid question. What happens if you need to change? Which is part of the issue, right? With this layout. It's all right, so. Board number one. Board number two, I literally just did this in the other class too, taking pictures of the board. <laughs> so what would happen is what in your in your case, I'm just going to take off the word customer here and just put in name. Theoretically, if we had a discount, it would have been it would have been happening at this point, like this, and it would be just like that. It's just one more column. So it's not really adding anything. It's not taking anything away. All that's happening is over here, we'd just be adding. Ouch. The discount would come here. And then customer would have a discount here. and we'd have the same transitives. So we'd be starting at the same spot, we just have more columns. I just shaved off a few columns just to reduce the amount of uh, writing it's doing. But I will be doing, um, not this week, maybe next week, uh, I'll come in with all my markers and I'll do another example of this so you guys really have a good handle on this. That's a little more complicated than this, and I'll go past just normalization. I'll actually go, I'll diagram it, like the whole thing's front to back. And you'll see me come in with my tripod because I'll set the camera in the middle. So you see, so I can grab the whole thing. All right, so any other questions about normalization? I've learned that doing a short lecture on normalization is usually more productive than doing a two hour lecture because I spend two hours talking and by the end, everybody's confused. Instead of just concentrating on the the descriptions of things. It's uh, usually a better way to teach normalization. Um, for your labs, you know, you're gonna have a normalization labs soon. Um, this is the steps you need to go through. That's all there is to it. Any other questions on normalization before I let you guys go home nice and early? 
Okay, two questions. She beat you by like that much. No, she went. She's going first. She beat you. Like by like half a second. Like your hand, her hand moved towards yours. Okay, what's your question? Yeah, the discount. Yeah, this uh, like he said. What happens if the customer always has a discount, right? Which is different than if what happens if the order has a discount, right? Which is a different question. Which, hang on, let me erase things. I'll I'll cover that. Why not? What the hell? There's no reason not to cover it really quick. Oh, there is an eraser. My hands are starting to look a little ick. Okay, so let's get rid of the discount from here, from here, and from here. Okay, and we end up with, instead, the discount on the order line. So the guy had a coupon or something, got a discount. So we have, yeah, well, actually, it'd be the, uh, at that point, it would be on the order line. So the discount would be here. So in the end, it would move here and it would be here instead. So if you do the discount in a slightly different spot, all that's happening is it's moving locations and it ends up never ends up being a transitive dependency. So if it's a discount per order line, then it's over here. Or there's also the case of if you want to do the discount on the entire order. So you'd have it here, but it would only be dependent on that and not on the customer. And the, end, the discount would end up living here instead. It all depends on how you want to interpret how discounts are used. That's all. So which is where business rules come in that determine a discount must be applied to the customer or the discount is applied to the order or the discount is applied to the order item. The business rule will determine where the discount moves to. But yeah, that's a good one. He opened up a can of worms and she dove in head first. We we designed a third normal form. Um, anything less than this, and it's your, your there's going to be issues. Well, when you're starting out, yes. If you've been doing it for 27 years, it just happens automatically. <laughs> like when I'm the when I do database design, I don't go through these steps very much because I've done it so much over my career that I'll, I I skip these steps because I know intuitively that if I put this here, I'm going to have problems later. Therefore, it just gets moved out. So I designed a third normal form right off the bat. But yes, when you're starting out, you might do a design and then you'll want to take a look at your design and, and look at each table and see if it can be normalized. And I still do that, I'll still do that. Like I'll do a design, then I see if it can be normalized. I mean, I've got some pretty big designs uh, I've worked with over the years. Um, I mean, This database design has been severely normalized. In actual fact, this diagram is out of date. It's out of date by about six tables. This is in production. This is a real database people pay us money for. What does this power? Just for those of you that are curious, what does it power? This website. Automotive templates, yay. 
It's not an exciting website, but and it just keeps drilling down until you can find the right template. You know when you um you see vans and cars going around that are big covered in big giant stickers? You know they're branded, they're 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 what it's called wrapped. And they wrap the car with, you know, the branding of the plumbing company or whatever. They use these templates to do them. These are uh, these templates are accurate to the millimeter of the car. That's one of one of our divisions of company I work for. We there's a guy who actually sits there and makes these templates. That's his job. He's been doing this for 26 years. Um, but yeah, so that site powers this. And there's a lot behind this. There's a whole shopping site that's running off this where you can go and buy the annual subscriptions to the product. There is a um, an estimating tool that's included if you've paid for it, which is cool. So I can take this and I want to go run an estimate on this Raptor, wait for it, where you can run an estimate and actually estimate how much material. So you can say, we're going to cover this part of the car. It's going to cost you this much money. So we, you know, I wrote all of this. Except for the estimating tool. That's not me. That's another guy. But everything else but the estimating tool was me. So if any of you are curious what I do for a living, that's literally what I do for a living is this. But yeah, so that database is powering this. Yes, it's been normalized. But yeah, that, you know, when you have a big design, you will end up having to normalize. And sometimes you can't help but not norm. Like sometimes you, you end up having to not normalize uh, because it's just how it works. Um, just for performance reasons. Actually, I actually have a really good example of something that's not normalized properly uh, because we chose it to not be uh, this, no, come on. It really doesn't like a touchpad, this software. This one right here. You'll notice that we have stuff in here that really shouldn't be there, like tax rate, um, discount amount, the price is in here, which normally the price is part of the product, right, not the order line. But the issue is that when we do the the summarization, if the price of the product changes, we still need to be able to run reports of what something sold for. So we de we chose to denormalize because once it's been, we're not going to change how much it was sold for again. So even though the product suddenly might be $3.99 next year, but it was $2.99 this year, we have to know the fact that it sold for $2.99. So that's a good use for uh, denormalization. And that's, you know, that allows us to run those graphs that fast. Like this is going back to two, this is just, just summarized data from 2011 to today. Just the time it took to load the graphs. Actually the animation animation of the graph, I just did that to make the sales guy happy. They was already loaded by the time it was drawing that. So yeah. So that's uh, literally what a normalized database can let you do is this, which is why normalization is important. So yes, I do normalize. Oh, they're not having actually they're having a really good month. I <laughs> think of that sales month. They're having a really good month because that was last year. This is this year, and they're actually going to beat last year's number again, which is good. We want them to make more money. Profit center. All right. So that's it for normalization. Like I said, um, next week is going to be what the heck is next week. Just so you guys know what you're coming into next week. Week four. Oh, physical design. So what I just showed you guys with all the data types, it's a different design tool. You guys are using MySQL Workbench. Because at work, we don't use MySQL. We use something else. So different design tool. But you're going to be learning about physical design next week. The week after that is going to be about, um, you're going to be learning about indexes and uh, that kind of uh, indexes and views. And I will be doing 
Um, either next week or the week after, I'm going to carry my markers both cases and I'll do a complete example from start to end, including the physical design. I'll do it all on the board. So that's what you guys have got coming down the pipe. Outside of that, you guys are free to run unless you have more questions.